right, so welcome to Math 389, lecture, I believe, 12. And so what I want to do today, especially if, you know, FIDA is going to be mounted today, is I want to make sure we finish enough of the Fibonacci and Zeckendorf type projects so that you have a good sense of what it would be like if you chose this to be the main focus of what you're writing on for this course. Now, one of the things that's nice about this is there's a tremendous number of different problems you can look at. So the goal is to just keep talking about various things that you can explore further. And this is one of the reasons I love these problems so much. It's a great way to start seeing a lot of math and to start seeing how they can be applied. So, you know, we ended last time with Binet's formula, which is a beautiful closed form expression for the nth Fibonacci number. And you know, as a nice exercise, try to figure out how many digit operations would you have to do to calculate the billionth or the trillionth Fibonacci number by hand? And just how painful it would be to go through that calculation slowly, step by step by step. With Binet's formula, we can just jump to it immediately. It also shows us a nice application of partial fractions. And so frequently in earlier math classes, you often see painful problems just as a way for the professor or the teacher to make sure that you've mastered the material. So I'm going to have the exponential of the exponential, and I want to differentiate this. Why? You know, why would I ever want to do something like that? Well, we'll see later today, hopefully, an example where something like that actually does arise. OK, so what I want to do is talk just briefly um, about some of the issues in going further from the Fibonacci numbers. And again, if you're interested in having this being one of the things you'll write about, I will go into much greater detail. Right now, what I want to do is just an extremely high level. So one of the bread and butters in mathematics is identities. If you can find an identity, this is extremely valuable. Does anybody know any identities in mathematics? Well, okay. I mean, form formulas where something equals something. Good, sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. So no matter what value of x you give me, beautiful. Now you can create a new identity from sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. You can take the derivative of both sides. What's the derivative going to be? Do you think this is gonna be something interesting? Before you even do the calculation, sine squared plus cosine squared equals one, Let's take the derivative. Do we expect this to be something that's going to be of interest? Yeah, it's going to be something equals zero. OK, so if something has a derivative that's always zero, what does that mean about the function? Well, which is not surprising, sine squared plus cosine squared is one. So we're probably not going to get anything new or useful by taking the derivative of sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. And the reason is because it's a constant. When we take the derivative, we get nothing. But if we take something else, if we take the geometric series formula, um, then that's a completely different story. So let's see if um, this pen actually will work here. No, it will not. So I will try to do this by hand. So we know one plus x plus x squared plus dot, dot, dot. What does that equal? Well, uh, nope, almost. Nope. I'm just being really technical. You can't x, right? And are there any conditions on this? Good. So this is true if the absolute value of x is less than 1. Now, one of the things that is truly remarkable about the geometric series formula uh, is that I guess it provides painting services in the Boston area. I did not know that. So one of the things that's remarkable about the geometric series is if you truncate it, at a certain point and look at the tail, the tail itself is a geometric series. So it makes it a lot easier to justify a lot of the operations with a geometric series because we can truncate it. So if I look at the first couple of terms, one plus x plus dot, 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 plus x to the n, and then look at what follows from that point onward, everything is going to be x to the n plus one, x to the n plus two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I can pull out an x to the n, and then I'll have a geometric series, right? which is of course just one over one minus X. So with a little bit of algebra, you can actually show that this infinite sum is equal to sum all the way up to the power X to the N. And then what's left over is a geometric series. Use the geometric series up to that. Why is this useful? Well, now if I want to justify differentiating term by term, 
I want to use the derivative of a sum as the sum of the derivatives. So not surprisingly, sometimes material could fit in either book project, either in the analysis, you know, interchanging operations, or it could fit into the Fibonacci. I would love to say the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives. Well, we only prove that when we have a finite sum in calculus. Technically, they only did it, I think, when you have two sums. Did we talk about this in this class? Okay, so we'll, we'll talk about that in, in a moment. Can we differentiate term by term? What would we get? And I'm actually gonna take x d by dx, not just d by dx. So we take the derivative term by term, what's the derivative of one? Zero, and then we multiply by x and so we just get zero. What's the derivative of x? One, and then we multiply by x, then we would get x. What's the derivative of x squared? 2x, and we multiply by x, we would get 2x squared. What's the next term going to be? To be x cubed. And then that should be the derivative of 1 over 1 minus x. So that's 1 minus x to the negative 1. It's negative 1, 1 minus x to the negative 2. Derivative of 1 minus x is going to be another negative 1. Multiply by x. So when the dust settles, it's x over 1 minus x squared. So you've got to justify taking derivatives term by term. If you look at this piece over here, we can take the derivative. And as long as x is less than 1, well, as n gets very, very large, x to the n is going to be extremely small. And so you can show that the contribution from this piece is going to tend to 0 as n gets very, very large. So again, right now, I'm just trying to give you a sense of what's out there. You can justify differentiating term by term by doing an argument like this. You could also go back to real analysis where you might have done this in multivariable calculus, but probably unlikely that if you have a series that converges absolutely, you can differentiate term by term inside that radius of convergence. And so we could just start off with that top line and just take the derivatives, but it's nice for the geometric series. We can do this um, a lot easily, a lot more easily. Well, if I take x equals one half, That gives me the sum of n over 2 to the n is equal to 2. Because I'd get 1 half divided by 1 half squared. That's just a 2. We've now calculated a formula for the sum of n over 2 to the n. Now, if I gave you the sum of 1 over 2 to the n, that's not so bad. You know, we know how to do that sum. That's just the geometric series. I'm not going to type that. It's just wrong. But now, we can take the derivative of the geometric series and we get a new identity. We get x plus 2x squared plus 3x cubed and so on and so on and so on is x over 1 minus x squared. And now I think you can see why I'm taking not just the derivative, but x times the derivative. It keeps the power of x the same as it was before. It's just a question of which way is going to lead to cleaner algebra. So this gives me a formula for the sum of n over 2 to the n or n over 3 to the n, or n over 5 to the n, or n times 2 fifths to the n, anything like that. How could I get another identity? What, what could I do again? Yeah, differentiate that, loud of repeat. I can generate infinitely many identities from one identity. This is the power of differentiating identities. It's an incredible technique, okay? Is everybody comfortable with this? So the idea is if you have an identity and you can differentiate, you can generate more identities from it. Um, just as an aside, I'll just quickly show you how do you actually prove the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives. So you would do this proof by induction. So let's assume we know f plus g prime is f prime plus g prime. What if I gave you the sum of three functions how would you take the derivative of the sum of three fun functions? We group it as, a, as f plus g is we group that together. And if we do it like that, now it's just the derivative of f plus g plus the derivative of h. But we're now using the fact that we know the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives. Now, what do we do for f plus g prime? Yeah, just, just keep using the first part. And now I'm being extremely pedantic. I'm keeping the parentheses. 
Now what do we do? Now we can just drop the parentheses. And this is just going to be f prime plus g prime plus h prime. And hopefully you can see the proof by induction coming in here. This works for any finite sum. This is probably something that was not done when you were doing differentiation years ago. You probably proved it, hopefully you proved it for the sum of two functions. And then the teacher probably never really said anything about when you have more sums, but you've got to be careful. And if you're not careful, uh, you might assume that this works if you have infinitely many terms and that is not always the case. There is, um, well, uh, some of you may have seen this, but I can prove everybody's has the same name. Does anybody disagree with the statement that everybody has the same name? All right, do you have your ID on you today? Okay, I need to see your ID. And just so I know what I'm trying to prove. All right, I'm gonna prove everybody is named Kiel. Okay. Does everyone agree that you are named Kiel? You disagree, Kiel, why? You don't know your own name? So my statement PN will be all in group of size N have the same name. Has everybody seen proofs by induction? Is there anybody who has not seen proofs by induction? Okay, so do we all agree the base case, P1 is trivial? We're all comfortable with that. If you have a group with just one person, everybody in the group has the same name. All right, let's do the inductive step now. So inductive step. So let's assume Pn is true. So we will now assume that whenever we have n people, they all have the same name. Now we're gonna show Pn plus one holds. All right, so let's imagine we have n plus one people. So I'm not gonna bother drawing them well. One, two, dot, 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 n minus one, n, n plus one. Can somebody give me a group of n people from these n plus one people? Yeah, give me a group of n people from these n plus one. Yeah, so take the first n people, x and q. Can someone else give me a group of n people? Okay, so let's do the last. Notice we have some people who are in both groups. So everybody in the first group has the same name as two. Everybody in the last group has the same name as Kiel, person number two. Therefore, everybody is named Kiel. Is there something wrong with this proof by induction? But that's how induction works. You assume it's true for n, and then show it's true for n plus one. We did the base case. We showed that it's true when we have just one person. You know, whenever you have a group of just one person, everybody clearly has the same name. We then get to assume that the statement is true whenever we have n, a group of n people. And then we show that if it's true for n, we then show that it's true for n plus one. Is there something wrong with this proof? I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear your kill. What was that? Um, here, plus one person might have a different name. But, but I'm saying everybody in the second group has the same name as person two. Everybody in the first group has the same name as person two. Therefore, everybody has the same name as person two. The induct, my, my statement PN is in any group of size N, everybody has the same name. So I have two different groups of size N. Everybody in those groups have the same name by the inductive assumption. I don't understand why people have so much trouble naming their kids. 
it's extremely easy to make mistakes and to gloss over things. We have to prove that whenever PN is true, PN plus one is true. I've implicitly assumed something here. I've implicitly assumed that N is so large that there actually is a person two that's in both groups. So for example, imagine, uh, I think this was the call of the people. Imagine N equals one. Here's one, here's two, also known as N plus one. And now if I try to do my two groups, is there anybody in common? No. And so the problem is there is not necessarily person two in both groups. If you knew that whenever there were two people, they had the same name, then yes, it would propagate to everybody has the same name. We just use the magic you know, person. And just, if every group of two people have the same name, we first do the two of us, then the two of us, then the two of us, and keep marching down like that. This is essentially a broken staircase. There's one step that's missing. If we had that step, then we would be able to prove that everybody has the same name. The point of this is to just show you how careful you have to be about statements. Okay, just because something seems reasonable, just because it looks valid in some situations, does not mean it's always going to work. And so when we have the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives, that's only working in the special case of a finite sum. And so I just want you to be careful about stuff like that. So you're switching back to the Fibonacci's. Let's let f of x be one half x plus one fourth x squared plus one eighth x cubed, and so on and so on and so on. This is basically the geometric series where rather than using x, I'm using x halves. Not a big deal. And it turns out that we can do something that's called you know, the method of moments. And we can take derivatives of this, and we can calculate various sums that we need. And again, the whole point of differentiating identities is that once you have one identity, it allows you to generate more identities from that. So I wanna just quickly make sure we're all on the same page about probability distributions. So hopefully you've seen something about a probability distribution at some point in your life. So we'll say X is a random variable. You usually use capital letters for random variables, lowercase for the values. So X is a random variable with density. So people either write F or they write P or they might write F sub X or P sub X. You have to decide what kind of notation do you want? The more random variables you have going on, the worse it would be to just say the density is F or P because there's so many things in play. If I put a subscript, I'm telling you which random variable is associated to this. And so we'll say, uh, Random variable has this as its density if the following happens. Let's say f of x is greater than or equal to zero. The integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of x dx equals one. And the probability that we take on a value between a and b is just the integral from a to b of f of x dx. So this would be a continuous probability distribution. This is one of the reasons why you spend so much time learning calculus and integrals. Integrals give you areas under curves. Areas under curves can give us probabilities. So these are extremely reasonable things. You know, my density should never be negative. No matter how bad you are, can you give me a lower bound on your probability of winning a game? Zero. No matter how good you are, can you give me an upper bound? On one, is it possible to give 120%? No, you, you can't really give more than 100%. If you're giving more than 100%, you probably misevaluated what 100% was, right? So probability should be numbers between zero and one or in percentage between zero and 100%. And if I want to find the probability that I take on a value between A and B, I just integrate the curve from A to B. You should have all seen Taylor series. And the idea for Taylor series is if my function is nice, hopefully I can write my function as a Taylor series. You know, it's a sum 
n goes from zero to infinity, it'll be the nth derivative at zero over n factorial x to the n. And that would be the Taylor series of my function about zero. And if you're lucky, the Taylor series will converge. And what should it converge to? Well, so I have some function f. And on the right-hand side, I have its Taylor series. Assume you're lucky enough and the Taylor series converges. What should it converge to? What function? Yeah, it should converge to f, right? If the Taylor series doesn't converge to f, that should be horrible. Right? Well, if I give you the function f of x equals e to the negative one over x squared, if x is not zero and zero, if x equals zero, it's a nice exercise to calculate that all of its derivatives at zero equals zero. And the probably the easiest way to do this is to use L'Hopital's rule. So this is a great calculation that you should try to do, is prove all the derivatives of this function equals zero at zero. Let's think about what this means. So at time zero, you're at the origin. Your instantaneous speed is zero. Your acceleration is also zero. Does anybody know what the third derivative is called? The jerk, your jerk is zero. Does anybody know the fourth, fifth, and sixth derivatives names? Yes, it is snap, crackle, and pop. Your snap, your crackle, and your pop are all zero as well. I think after that, we've stopped giving names. But you have this ridiculous situation where all of your derivatives are zero, and yet you move. So the Taylor series converges, but it does not converge to your function except at the point zero, which really isn't that big of a deal because when you look at the expansion, well, when x equals zero, the only term that survives is the constant term f of zero. So of course they have to agree there. This function is of extremely rapid decay. If you take x equals one over a thousand, then this would be e to the negative one million. That's small. This function decays incredibly rapidly. What this tells us is that Taylor series are not unique. I could take any function and I could add this to it. So for example, if I give you um, the sum of x to the n over n factorial, uh, does anybody have any thoughts as to what function this is? What am I thinking of? I'm actually thinking of e to the x plus 1701 times f of x, where f of x is function above. I'm sorry? Yeah, I mean, if I'm just looking at this as a Taylor series, if I just tell you the Taylor series is x to the n of n factorial, this function also has that as its Taylor series. So unfortunately, just knowing a Taylor series is not enough to uniquely determine a function. You need to know more. And so in probability, we have an analog of Taylor series. So what we can do is we'll call these the moments. So the nth moment is defined as the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x to the n uh, f of x dx. And the hope is that if you know the moments, you know the distribution. So you've all seen some of the moments. The first moment is the, so from integrating x, f of x, anybody know? What, 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 what do we call the first moment? The first moment has a nice name. No? So let's think about what's going on. If I give you the first moment, I take all the possible values of the function and I weight it by the probability I chose it. It's the, which, it's the, it's the mean. So the first moment when n equals one is just the mean value. For each possible value, I weighted by the probability it occurs. The second moment is related to the standard deviation. And then the next moments are related to the shape as to how things are. And so when we come over here, when we're trying to show that these 
distributions for the number of summons converges to Gaussians, one way is this method of moments, is we actually calculate the moments, we calculate these expected values, and then we show that they converge to the moments of a Gaussian. And then we appeal to some results from advanced mathematics, which say that we're not in a terrible situation like that function whose um, all of its derivatives were zero. That knowing that the moments are converging with a little bit more information, we can then go from that to, uh, it has to be converging to the Gaussian. But there's some advanced technical stuff that's lurking in the background. Uh, I want to give you a little bit of a sense of how you attack some of these problems. Uh, it's a really beautiful idea that occurs in a lot of mathematics. So let's say we want to calculate how many items, how many integers between fn and fn plus one have exactly k summons. So let's let p and k be the number of integers in this interval from fn to fn plus one that have exactly k summons. Well, what I'm going to do is it's a little bit easier. I'm going to look at from the interval fn plus one to fn plus two, and I'll study k plus one summons. Okay. So I have a formula for pn plus one k plus one. We know that we have to have fn plus one as our first summoned, otherwise we're too small. Could we have fn as our next summoned? Okay, why not? Right, then we would have two things that are adjacent. It's not a, it's not a second door. So we can't have fn, but we could have fn minus one. If we have fn minus one, then from that point onward, it's like we're having a decomposition of something between fn minus one and fn. And how many summons would that have? So the whole number has to have k plus one summons. We just used one summon at fn plus one. And so now if we have fn minus one, how many summons do we have remaining? We have k summons remaining. So the number of ways to do that would be pn minus one k. I have to have k summons and I include the n minus first summoned. What if we don't have fn minus one? Maybe we have fn minus two. And that's where the p n minus two k comes from. And what would be the next thing we could have? p n minus three k. And we can keep going and going and going. And now here's the beautiful idea. So now we do this again but we do it not for the interval fn plus one to fn plus two, but for the interval fn to fn plus one. So the only thing that changes is the index n is a little bit smaller. The index is now n rather than n plus one. So if you look at these two expressions, it should be screaming at you something to do. What should we do? Subtract, right? This is the telescoping sum. You might have seen this in calculus. This is going to be tremendous cancellation. If you look at this recursion relation, this is horrible. You know, this is a recursion relation with two indices, and the number of terms is going to be growing with my index n. But if I subtract, all of a sudden things become much nicer. And now I get pn plus 1, k plus 1 is just pn k plus 1 plus pn minus 1k. Oh. That's much easier to work with. And so there are techniques that you can do with that. You can build a generating function similar to what we did before. And you can actually find ways to pull out what the values of the PNK are. So these generating function ideas are extremely powerful. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the you know, differentiating identity stuff. It just it exists. Um, I will just say that if you go from the Fibonacci's to the more general case, the recursion relationship becomes a little bit more involved. The polynomial for the generating function for the Fibonacci isn't too bad. For the general case, it's becoming a bit more involved. And I'm very fortunate that I have worked with many wonderful students at Williams over the years, and they were the ones who handled you know, doing all the algebra associated to stuff like this. Okay, so what I wanna do for the remainder of the time today, I don't think we're gonna to get to longest gap today, is talk about gaps in the bulk. So one of the most important things in life is trying to figure out how long do you have to wait for something? Uh, have we talked about bank lines in this class yet? Yep, so when I was young, there was just one line per teller. 
And they've discovered that this is not a good way to do things. Because if you have one person who has tremendous needs, they knock everybody in that line into a long, long wait. And you have people who get frustrated. Now, the average wait time doesn't really change if you just go to the next available teller. What changes is the variance, is you no longer have anybody, you're a couple of people being singled out with really bad weights. You basically spread the pain. And that's much better in terms of managing expectations. We often want to figure out how long did you have to wait for something? I think we've talked a little bit about Disney and managing you know, lines there. They are phenomenal. They have to be at knowing how long something is going to be. If you are planning something and you're told it's going to be a 40 minute wait and it's a 35 minute wait, is that a big deal? If you're told it's 40 minutes and it's 50 minutes, that's bad because now they've gone over. And so you often want to figure out how long do you have to wait before things occur? Another good example is lightning strikes or you know, when things fail, you know, how long do I have to wait or can I expect to wait before I'm going to have two things hitting in the same place? And so what I want to do is I want to try to study gaps between summons. So we're going to look at second of decompositions. And the question is, how long do I have to wait to get my next summon? And of course, depending on what number you have, it has a given expansion. So whatever it is, it is. You just have to compute it. So we can try to calculate things on average. And one of the big themes in mathematics is the more you average, the easier it is. But of course, the harder it's going to be to see uh, special behavior. Do you believe that you are a representative set of students at Williams College? No. In what way are you non-representative? All probably math majors, or strongly considering math majors, or a friend of mathematics, something along those lines. Would we be shocked if by the time anybody in this class graduates, that you don't have at least one eighth of your classes in math. What about at least one fourth? I don't think that would be true of a generic William student. Right? There's a lot of other conversations you could have. I'm going to play it safe and not have those, but I do not think that this is a generic set. You know, if I want to look at average math ability of a Williams undergraduate, this is not the class I would give a you know, math diagnostic test to, to find out how good is the average Williams student at math. So the larger set you look at, the more likely you are to have interesting behavior averaged out and not you know, be visible. So now at Williams, we have a tremendous number of math majors. We don't have that many uh, maybe classic majors. And so if you want to look at, you know, Greek and Latin ability. Is anybody here who can read Latin or Greek? I'm sure there's some people on campus who can do that. But if we just looked in the population here, we would completely miss that. <laughs> so the biggest space you average over, the less likely it is for you to see some interesting behavior. So as a general rule, you want to look at the largest, I'm sorry, the smallest space that you need to where you have averaging tools and techniques to attack problems. So the more you average over, the more likely you are to miss interesting things. So you want to look at a small subset where you can see something of interest. OK, so what we want to do is we want to look at a specific number, look at executive decomposition, and then see what are the distribution between its gaps. You can do this. And for a specific number, you can show with extreme confidence that there's a geometric decay uh, in terms of the, the number of gaps that have length two versus three versus four versus five. It's much easier if I look at all numbers between Fn and Fn plus one. And for all of these numbers, I look at all of the gaps and I put that all in a giant bin and I see how many of the gaps to length two, how many of the gaps to length three, how many of the gaps to length four. That's much easier to do because I'm looking at all the numbers simultaneously. With much more work, you can look at an individual number and see how often does an individual number have gaps of length two or three or four. Is there anybody who is concerned about running out of oxygen in class today? You know, if we assume each molecule of air has a 50-50 chance of being in the front or the back, it is possible that all the air molecules could be in the front of the room. 
Is anybody worried? Why not? Very, very strong. We can even quantify, you know, if you have n air molecules, then you would expect to have n halves in each, and the fluctuations are going to be of size square root of n. Anybody want to give me a lower bound for how many air molecules there are in this room? That's reasonable, because I know we have, yes, there's at least one air molecule. Can somebody give me a reasonable lower bound for the number of air molecules? Billion is definitely reasonable lower bound. If you know some chemistry or some physics, you might be able to give me a better. I'm sorry? Two to the 40, I think, is way too high. So who remembers their chemistry? Someone's constant? Avogadro's constant? It's on the order of 10 to the 23. That's a mole. There's at least a mole of air in this room, right? So I know there's at least your 10 to the 23. And so the square root of 10 to the 23, it's around say 10 to the 11, 10 to the 12. If you look at the fraction of that, so you know I expect it to be n halves molecules plus or minus the square root of n over n halves. Well, okay, the square root of n over n halves, 10 to the 11 over 10 to the 22, okay. That's one over 10 to the 11. I'm not gonna really notice a one over 10 to the 11 error. So I'm not really worried about uh, people suffocating in this class. Mortem I'm quite concerned about, and that's why I'm trying to make sure we talk about fun things like Fibonacci numbers, but yeah, suffocation, no, that's not a danger for any of this. So what we wanna do is we wanna look at gaps. If I look at all of the numbers between Fn and Fn plus one, it's much easier than looking at a specific number, but you can do a specific number. So let's say we have uh, some decomposition. So let's say we can write our numbers Fi1, I2, da, 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 all the way up to Fin. Then the gaps are just gonna be the differences between adjacent indices. So if I give you, for example, uh, maybe F1 plus F8 plus F18, the gaps would be seven and 10. You could also, if you want, say that there's a gap maybe of length one from the very beginning, but that's only going to be one gap. You've got to imagine we're letting n go to infinity, so the number of gaps is going to be on the order of 0.276n. One gap is not going to really change anything. So I want to calculate what's the probability of having a gap of length two? What's the probability of having a gap of length three? And I'm going to do this by looking at all the numbers between fn and fn plus one. And so what we'll do is we'll let P and K be the probability that we have a gap of length K. So we're gonna look at all of the gaps. That's gonna be our denominator, the total number of gaps. And the numerator is gonna be how many gaps of length K. So one possibility of course is you give me an N and I will just write down the second of decomposition for every number from Fn to Fn plus one. I will then calculate the gaps and then I will count how many of them are of size two. So if I gave you n equals three or four, you could easily do this by brute force. If I give you n equals a billion, this would be disastrous. You know, there's way too many things. So I need a good way to count how many gaps are there of length two, how many gaps are there of length three. And once I figure that out, hopefully there will be a limit. Hopefully if I take the limit as n goes to infinity, that will converge to something nice. Now, instead of asking this about the Fibonacci numbers, you could ask this for other things. We could do this for base two. We could do this for base 10. We could do this for other recurrences. So I'm gonna just state the results first. So the first is if we look at gaps in base B, we have the following explicit formula. What do you think would be a really bad base to use? would be a really bad choice of B if you're trying to write something in base B. We normally do 10, computers do base two. I'm sorry? No. What would be a really bad integer base to use? Zero would be bad. What else would be bad? One, because then one, one squared, one cube under the fourth, they would all be the same. And so if we look at what's going on over here, um, you know, if we take you know, B equals one, Oh, great. this is going to just reduce down. You know, things are going to be a little bit screwed. It's always nice to do some kind of sanity checks. 
For the second of decomposition, what we're going to get is a nice geometric decay. And I'll leave it as an exercise to, can you rewrite phi times phi minus one in a more illuminating manner? But every time we increase k by one, the probability decreases by another factor of one over three. Uh, you can generalize this to other recurrences. I don't really want to talk about that today. So I want to give you a quick sketch of how do we count the number of gaps. And one of the biggest problems in combinatorics is it's so easy to accidentally count something multiple times or to forget to count it at all. So we have to make sure that every gap is counted once and only once. Well, the first thing is we need to know how many gaps are there. Well, you know, we've talked about the proof that the distribution of the number of gaps becomes a Gaussian. We know what the mean is. We know what the standard deviation is. And so we know how many numbers there are between Fn and Fn plus one. The number of numbers is just Fn minus one. We know the average number of gaps per summand is just n over p squared plus one. So the total number of gaps is just this product. Really, it should be one less than Fn minus one because my, the number of gaps is one less than the number of summons. When I had three summons, how many gaps did we have? We had two gaps. Okay. When these numbers are very large, decreasing it by one is not going to make a difference. You know, this is equivalent to telling you know, Elon Musk, you know, I'm sorry, we made a mistake. You have one dollar less in your bank account than you thought. You know, he should smack you for wasting his time you know, telling him this. right? So I'm not going to really worry. That's why I'm going to put the little squiggly sign here. Let's try to count how many gaps there are of a given length. And so here is a really good variable to use to count. So xij is going to count how many times do we have an m, an integer between fn and fn plus 1, that has fi and fj in its decomposition, but nothing between i and j. OK? So it's going to count how many integers have a gap of length j minus i that starts at fi and ends at fj. So it's not just a gap of a given size. It's a gap at a given size at a given location. And so now, if I want to calculate what's the probability of a gap of length k, well, if I just take j to be i plus k, that gives me a gap of length k. And this will count how many gaps of length k do I have that start at the i-th spot. And then I just sum over all possible values of i. I could be as low as 1. Why can't i be larger than n minus k? So what would happen if we chose i to be, we would have x, n, n plus k. Why would that be bad? Yeah, it's over. You know, the largest sum we can have is you know, fn. So i can't be larger than n minus k. Otherwise, we would exceed. We'd go beyond the limit. So that's what we want to calculate. So the question is, how many decompositions have a gap from f5 to f i plus k. So I claim that the number of choices is actually just the product of two Fibonacci numbers. And so rather than going through the math text, which I will just you know, put up over here, because you can always hit pause, I would much rather just draw a picture. And so much of what we do is we try to always reduce things to things we already know. So here's f1, dot, 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 dot. Here's fi, let's do fi minus one, here's fi, here's fi plus one, dot, 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 here's fj, here's fj plus one, dot, 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 and here at the very end is fn. So everybody agree? You know, if I want to have a gap of length, um, I think we, we wanted a gap of length k. So I will then make this i plus k, and this would be i plus k plus 1. So I have to have fi. I have to have fi plus k. 
and all the other stuff in between, I don't have. Does everybody agree? What about FN? Do we have FN or do we not have FN? We have to have Fn because we want to be in the interval Fn to Fn plus one. So if you look at what's going on now, if I look over here, I have Fi and then F1 dot 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 Fi minus one is free as long as it's legal. So I can fill these in any way I want as long as I don't choose two things that are adjacent. If you think about it, that's exactly talking about how many Zeckendorf decompositions do I have whose largest index is Fi. That's just counting how many integers are there between Fi and Fi plus one. So how many ways are there to fill this in? So how many legal ways can we fill in? not in and is not and is not playing a role here we have to have fi so i is playing the role of n fi minus one it's just fi minus one and if you look at what's going on that is one of the two pieces we can choose the beginning any way we want so long as it's legal the second part is a little bit more involved, but it's very similar. We can't have fi plus k plus one. If we had that, we would have two things that are adjacent. So we don't have this, but fi plus k plus two is now free. It's the same problem as before, but we've shifted all the indices down. So I'll leave it as an exercise for you to shift things back. And when you shift things back, that that's how you get that the number of ways of doing the other part is fn minus k minus 2 minus i. And so we have an explicit formula for the number of ways to have exactly a gap of length k starting at fi. And now we just sum this over all i. And so we just have to figure out how do we sum a product like this? Well, if you use Binet's formula, it's going to give you two factors for each, and you multiply them out, and it's not so bad. So I don't think I do the algebra. No. Um, so I will leave that as an exercise for you to do the algebra. But using Binet's formula, we now have four geometric series, which we can do. We can get the main term. We can take the limit. So what I want you to get out of this today is we saw some really good techniques. And it turns out that we can completely answer this average gap question by coming up with the right way to count things. And so this is a nice way to talk about counting, about being careful not to double count. The simplest way to avoid double counting is I'm gonna look for a gap of length k and I'm gonna specify where it starts. So it's possible one integer m could have many gaps of length k, but it can only have one gap of length k that starts at a given spot. You can't have two gaps that start at the same place. All right, so this is a good place to stop for today.